The Tom Woods Show, episode 762. Prepare to set fire to the index card of allowable opinion. Your daily dose of liberty education starts here. The Tom Woods Show. Hello Fresh delivers fresh food right to your door that you prepare in your own kitchen. Check it out at HelloFresh.com and use coupon code WOODS to save $35 on your first week of deliveries. Hello everybody, Tom Woods here. I was going to release yet another ebook on a totally unrelated topic today, and then I looked through it and I realized, ah, darn it, there are a few changes I probably need to make to it. And I was going to do the whole episode based on the ebook, but I think I would be jumping the gun. I think I need an extra day or so. And tomorrow I'm going to be doing the episode with Lou, and then I've got another one lined up for Friday. So I'll probably launch this on Monday of next week. You've got enough to read from me, for heaven's sake, already, right, haven't you? With the NoStateEducation.com book about uh, why we don't need the state involved in education. You've got plenty of stuff to keep you busy for a few more days. So what I'm going to do instead in this episode is play for you an interview I did on Kennedy Financial's podcast in which I talked about all kinds of things, about what's ahead in terms of the economy. I think I talked about Bernie Sanders. We talked about gold and silver coins and what kind of coins you'd want and how you budget, and especially when you have oddball income like me, all kinds of things like that, building up separate income streams. All kinds of topics are covered in this conversation from just a couple months ago. I think it was late this summer, 2016. So here we go. Tom, thanks for coming on Kennedy Financial. My pleasure. Thanks for having me. Tom, my brother John and I talk about you often on this program. We admire your work. And one of the things that we like about you most is the fact that you left the safety and security of life as a college professor for the risky life of an entrepreneur. How did you successfully make this transition? And really, what prompted the decision to leave the college environment? Well, when I left, I actually left to go to what was a reasonably secure job at first. I went to the Mises Institute in Auburn, Alabama, where I was in residence for four years and where I did earn a salary. So there was security there. But for a variety of reasons, just Auburn, Alabama wasn't quite working for our family, whether it was school or other other things just didn't quite work out because it was such a relentlessly college town. It was not such a great place to raise little children because there just wasn't much for them to do. So we we wound up moving to another state, and there I really was completely on my own. So that was really when I took the plunge. And I thought I could just more or less continue in my existing paths. I could do a lot of public speaking. I could do some online teaching. I could do this or that. And it got to the point where I was doing so much traveling and – just running myself ragged and putting a strain on the family that I decided I'm going to have to think a whole new way. I'm going to have to break out of my my box of traditional thinking. And little by little, because I have smart friends who give good advice, it occurred to me that I had built up enough of a following that I could parlay the following into a product. What is it that people like about me? They like that I give them the unvarnished, U.S. history. There's no political correctness in it. It's the real thing. Or they like real economics. They, they don't like what they read in the New York Times. So I could create a product out of that. And that was the key. I created libertyclassroom.com, which was a big success. And uh, over four years later, it's still going strong and we're still building it. It's still growing. And I created courses that people could listen to on the go. But they're not just courses taught by some uh, milk toast professor or certainly not some biased uh, left-wing professor, but rather by people who are going to give, basically give you the education you didn't get in school and and are going to teach you the economics that you believe really does explain how the world works. So that was a real key. And then from there, I began to fill in for Peter Schiff on his radio show. That spun off into my own podcast at TomWoods.com. I'm well over 700 episodes now. And that podcast has has been tremendous because there are various ways that I've been able to give away for free over 700 information-packed episodes and yet monetize that podcast to a point that I can live comfortably and provide well for my five children. So naturally, you went from a single income stream to now, as an entrepreneur, you advocate 
developing multiple income streams. That's really the only way to be successful, which kind of leads me to my next question. You're a husband and a father of five. Life is expensive for us under the Obama economy. And we have a, a question from one of your supporting listeners. In fact, Ryan asks, uh, how do you forecast your budget given the fact that your income stream may vary? Well, in the old days, it was very difficult. In the in let's say from 2010 to 12, when I was doing a crazy amount of public speaking, and that was a major ingredient in our uh, income, that was very hard to forecast because I don't know if I'm going to get invitations or not. And that made it all the more difficult because if I would get four invitations in a month, I'd, I would accept them all because who knows, maybe I'll get zero the next month. But then the next month would come along, I'd get three or four, and I'd say, well, I better take all of these because who knows about the next month. And it was just no way to live. So yeah, that that is – that's quite difficult. And the answer was, uh, uh, how, how did I manage it? Well, through sheer panic. <laughs> it really wasn't any other way. But then what started to happen is, yeah, I built up a number of income streams. I'm, I'm, you know, I'm not a millionaire, but I'm, I'm surviving well with the, with the, you know, all the kids and everything. The, it, it became, I, I realized that this particular income stream seems to have stabilized around this amount. Like I would think, what, what, what's the lowest amount in the past 12 months that this stream has generated for me? And then you can use that to budget. And you won't go far wrong. Like for instance, the Ron Paul curriculum. At ronpaulhomeschool.com, I have a nice affiliate site where I offer bonuses to people who join that program. Well, that is probably never going to go away. Because there's always going to be a demand for that product, and my bonuses are basically irresistible to anybody who wants to join that thing. So I just look at and I say, well, in the summer months, that thing does really, really well. And so, again, I can plan on the basis of past performance and say the worst that this has done is X level. So I'm going to proceed as if I, I can expect X dollars a month from that stream. And so when you go on a conservative estimate based on the minimum that you've received in a given month, you can come up with a bare bones kind of budget from there. And then everything you earn over and above that is gravy. So Tom, after you figured out your budget and you've paid all your bills and you've built up a savings for an emergency, the natural thing to do is to start to invest. And we live in an environment where everyone advocates the use of financial planners and advisors and 401k plans. And you're supposed to speculate in the stock market so that you can keep up with it with inflation and then retire with dignity in your golden years. But I've often heard you say that there was once a time in this country's great history where people could save without having to speculate or gamble in the stock market. So what did you mean by that? Well, what I meant was that in a, at a time when the money wasn't losing value every single year, uh, you didn't feel like a hamster on a wheel just trying to stay stable, just trying to stay in the same place. All you had to do, and you could do more than this if you wanted, but all you strictly had to do was accumulate gold and silver coins because when they circulated as money and they exchanged in every single market you know, for every single good, they had a tremendous stability or they gained in value over time. Now, it's not fair to compare it to today when they're not circulating as money the way they did in the past. But the point is you had this stability because the, the money stayed stable. In terms of its supply, there was a very, very modest growth uh, every year. And even if there was growth in the money supply, it was swamped by growth in the output of all other goods in the economy. So the ratio was such that those goods became less expensive in terms of your money, so your money became more valuable. Nobody had to go into the stock market or think about bonds or look at different types of financial instruments to keep his head above water. Now, if, if you're asking what I do with my own money uh, – you know, I, my my own strategy sort of evolves, but I'll tell you, I don't, I don't put money into retirement accounts or stuff like that. And I know that that sounds crazy to some people, but I, I'm I'm not interested in in running my financial life that way. What I do instead is I build up a, a large number of income streams that produce income consistently for me over time. And that way I don't have to worry about where the stock market goes or, or whatever, because these are income streams that even through depressions would still be strong. So, and I've got a bunch of them. I mean, of course, uh, I have a lot of affiliate stuff that I do that, that does very well. So there's, so there's that. Um, and I, you know, I have some precious metals 
and I have some I have several properties right now, and that's also a decent strategy that you you buy some properties, and you uh, you know you pay off the mortgage with the the rent, and eventually they are paid. Off. not caused by some mysterious free market force it was caused by people who it was caused by institutions like the various national banks and and it was caused by banks that uh, went away from the traditional rules of the, of the gold standard that actually the period where we probably had the most economic stability in, in terms of the banking sector was the period of the 1840s and 50s where we had, we had the independent treasury we came as close as we ever did to having the complete separation of bank and state, and the result was uh, was great stability. And and so it's not true that the Fed has given us fewer and shorter recessions and all that. This is a myth based on outdated data. And in fact, the Fed has given us probably the you know two of the worst downturns we've ever had, uh, which would be the Great Depression and the uh, the financial crisis that we saw in two thousand eight. So it's a myth. The whole uh, central bank thing. Is a is a myth, and I, I I have a huge, huge, just overwhelming array of of corroborating statistics on that in a 2011 book I wrote called Rollback.
Tom, one of the reasons that uh, we admire you is you not only have a keen understanding of economics and history, but you're always so optimistic. And despite some of the serious matters that you talk about on the Tom Wood show and Contra Krugman, you always seem to have a glimmer in your voice. I have to admit, though, I'm somewhat more pessimistic about the future of the U.S. economy. We have 100 million people out of the labor force. The national debt has doubled under the Obama administration, and the home ownership rate is now at an all-time low. So this is your chance to convince me. Why shouldn't I be so discouraged about the future of the U.S. economy? Well, that, that's, that is a good question. And, and I mean, I, I wouldn't say I'm necessarily always optimistic. I mean, certainly in the immediate run, despite the claims that we are experiencing a recovery, it still seems pretty darn sluggish to me. And there are plenty of indicators that I, I don't really like. Um, and I, I think there's a good chance that in the next few years, we'll see more clearly the, the ongoing weakness of the economy. I'm always struck by the David Stockman statistic that if we look back to the day Bill Clinton left office in the year 2000, and we go up to about now, we have 2 million fewer breadwinner jobs than we had back then. So it's, it's pretty grim. I, I'll, I'll definitely admit that. But I do think that the, <laughs> the silver lining is that the various government promises that have been made to so, so many people over the years are simply going to become impossible to keep. They will not be able to keep these promises. And there are people trying to warn about this. The obvious one is Medicare. That thing is so ridiculously underfunded that it's, it's going to be impossible to keep those, those promises. Then it turns out Medicare Part D is going to be a lot more expensive than people thought, as all these programs wind up being more expensive than people thought. So there is going to come a time, Gary North calls it the great default, there's going to have to come a time where the promises are broken. One way or another, they're going to be broken. And that's going to, be, that's going to cause severe dislocation for a lot of people. There's, there's no way to sugarcoat that. But on the other side of that, with that albatross removed from, from our necks and with people, I think, chastened by this experience, it will be a little bit harder to snooker them in the future about entrusting your economic security to this institution that just screwed everybody. And so I, I believe that after that, you will have a leaner.
That means you, know, you have a buyer's list. You got a list of people who have proven that they buy things. And then little by little through, you, know, you have to learn how to be an email marketer, but if you're good at it, you try and move them through that funnel. You know, try and get them to see your next, you know, your next highest item. And then eventually, maybe you have a webinar. That really helps to move people through the funnel. You have a webinar where you demonstrate the high ticket item. That pushes people, especially when you say, and I'll give you a bonus, but only if you get the product during the webinar. Well, people don't like to lose the opportunity to get a free bonus. Or if you give them a discount that's good only through the webinar. That sells a lot of high ticket items as well. Now, I realize that's a lot of advice that you could get very easily online, but it, it took me a long time for that to actually penetrate my thick skull, and it does work. The next question comes from Michael. Kennedy Financial is all about free market capitalism and sound money. So uh, this question kind of relates to that, but it's a little bit off of the things that we've already covered. And Michael asks, as a commercially viable author, how do you feel about intellectual property law? That's a good question. I have been very influenced by a guy named Stefan Kinsella, who's written on this at length. And uh, he's of the opinion that both on utilitarian grounds, but, but primarily on natural rights style grounds, that there is no case to be made for intellectual property. And the thing is that as I've listened to him, I can't quite find what's wrong with that argument. There's still a part of me that feels funny about it, but I can't he makes a very persuasive case. Now, I won't try to reproduce his argument because I won't do a good job. But if you look up Kinsella and intellectual property, you can read it for yourself. Now, it, this is something that, of course, is of immediate relevance to me because I, um, you know, I, I do sell books. That's true. Um, now, it's, it's not the case that an anti-IP person is saying that I can't reserve the right to make photocopies of the book or whatever. Uh, when I sell it, I absolutely can reserve that right. But the question would be, suppose somebody just finds my book on a uh, a park bench somewhere. They never agreed to refrain from making copies of it. So, but I can say with my, you know, my uh, videos that I sell, I can say, look, I'm not selling you the right to uh, show this to your whole family. I'm not selling you the right to copy it and put it on your website. I'm withholding that for myself. That's fine. Even I'm sure even Kinsella would say that that's fine. But in terms of books and whatever, I've been increasingly convinced that maybe there's, there is indeed a case for uh, abolishing intellectual property. Now you think, well, how could the author make a living that way? Well, there are a variety of ways, actually. And, and there is a good book called Against Intellectual Monopoly that goes through and actually looks at empirical examples. And I find that really with my books, almost any author will tell you that Mo almost no author makes his primary income through his books. Almost no one. But the book is the, is the thing that gets people to know who you are. And then once they read the book, well, then I take them and I say, well, if you want more where this came from, here, go get my free book over here. When they get my free book, I got them on my email list, and that's when I can start selling them things. So the book is really the entry point for me. It's the entry point to a public speaking career. It's the entry point to being able to sell them digital products based on the book, to sell them courses, to invite them to webinars, and that's really where the money is made. So the book is not really where you should be putting your hopes for your retirement income anyway. That's foolish. The book is simply the entry point to all the other things you have to offer. When I've followed this advice, and I've probably heard it from you, the book is your hook. And I've posted my book, Financial Judo, for free on Kennedy Financial. Anybody can download that. And obviously, the goal is to get folks not only to understand our work, but then move on to the next level in the funnel, as you suggested earlier. So, Tom, before we wrap up, what resources on personal finance or economics would you direct our audience to? And how can our listeners find your work and maybe even also find that high-ticket sales item? All right. Well, when it comes to personal finance, I always feel weird giving people advice or directing people anywhere. So I'm going to slightly cop out on that because I, I, I think people just need to do their own research and I don't have any particular insight into it other than just as a reasonably informed person. I will say there is a valuable course within the Ron Paul home school curriculum because it is a course on personal finance for teenagers. 
And can you imagine if Americans learned how to manage their finances and do savings and make budgets when they were teenagers and teaching teenagers how to manage what little money they have? Very valuable. It's taught by Timothy Terrell of uh, Wofford College. Very, very smart guy. Very valuable. And he's the father of several teens, so he knows what he's talking about. So if you are interested in helping to teach your own teenagers how to manage their money and you're interested in homeschooling, then take that course. Um, Ron Paul homeschool is the dot com is the website for that. In terms of my stuff, my project, my, my big uh, product is uh, libertyclassroom.com. And uh, that's over at, well, libertyclassroom.com. You can check out the sales page and see all the stuff that's offered there. It's trying to solve that pain point of that person who got the college education and now feels like, yeah, I was gypped. All I got was politically correct stuff. and uh, All I got was Paul Krugman style economics. Where do I start? I don't have the time to study. Well, you don't have to because you can just listen to it on your commute. So that's libertyclassroom.com. But the the real pivot of everything I do, the the – you know, the headquarters for everything that everything revolves around the podcast, everything I do, the free books I give away, it's all at tomwoods.com. And Tom, maybe I can plug one more thing for you. As I alluded to earlier, a couple of questions came from supportinglisteners.com, a group of I'm which uh, I'm a part of on your Facebook page. So how can uh, folks find that? Well, I feel funny if this is the first time they've heard me telling them, here's how you can donate to me <laughs> right away. <laughs> so I, I wouldn't normally promote this, but uh, supportinglisteners.com. First of all, I find it amazing that no other podcaster had thought of the domain name supportinglisteners.com. That was just sitting there. That's just, somebody should have grabbed that. Too bad for them. I grabbed <laughs> it. But supportinglisteners.com, it might still be worth looking at just as uh, an interesting lesson, an object lesson in – in how to support yourself independently. Because if you look at that site, you look at all the different support levels, this is what I'm able to offer people who support me simply because I've spent so many years producing products, whether it's physical books or eBooks or courses and videos um, or this private Facebook group or discounts on different products, all these sorts of things I make available over there so that people feel like they're getting more in value than they're giving to me. So it's not like when you, you donate to PBS and they send you some crummy umbrella. Like this stuff is at least as valuable as what people are donating, but a lot of it is digital. So the marginal cost to me is nothing, even though the sunk cost to me is certainly very high. Uh, but supporting listeners.com is worth looking at because it shows you that if you produce a lot of products, then after a while you can start giving them away in exchange for monthly support. Well, I would encourage everyone to check everything out that Tom just mentioned. Tom Woods, historian, economist, and entrepreneur. Thanks for coming on Kennedy Financial. My pleasure. All right, that was my appearance with Philip Kennedy on the Kennedy Financial Podcast. Check that out at philipkennedy.com. I'll link to that at tomwoods.com slash 762, so you can check out more episodes of that show. I do want to say a word of thanks to the folks at HelloFresh who have helped out the show I am not very good at, well, pretty much anything other than podcasting and writing. Those are the things I can do. Can't do anything else. Can't change a flat tire. Can't do pretty much anything. But HelloFresh helps me to prepare meals for the family, which is, in fact, what I do. I, I use it for that and have used it a number of times. And just recently with the kids, I we what it comes in the mail. You order in advance different meals and what they do is they send you exactly the food you need, exactly the ingredients and the exact amounts with an idiot proof recipe and you just take exactly what's there. You don't have to make any trips to the grocery store. If there's a little white wine vinaigrette that's called for, there'll be a little tiny bottle of it. Everything you need is in there. And I can sit there and have a nice little chit chat with the kids about, you know, what what did they do today and as we're chopping vegetables and chit chatting. So it's all fresh and great. Doesn't take long. And then we all toss it in a pot or something and cook it up, and it's a nice, fresh meal. So check it out, HelloFresh.com. Use coupon code WOODS, and they will give you 35 smackers off your first week's delivery. So that's HelloFresh.com, coupon code WOODS. Now, let's see here. I've got another website to tell you about, and it's not the same old, here's another libertarian website talking about the non-aggression principle and so on. I like it when these sites that listeners are creating are a little bit different. They 
shake things up a little bit. They're a little unusual, off the beaten path. And this one, to spell out the URL, it's oh-cs.com. And it stands for Other Hand Comic Strips. So oh-cs.com. And the creator describes it as a libertarian Christian webcomic that explores both politics and religion in a lighthearted and comedic way. Also on the site is his blog for when he wants to get more serious or give more background detail. So check out oh-cs.com for other hand comic strips. I'll link to that as the listener website mentioned at tomwoods.com slash 762. Get your own shout out and many resources from me. If you get your hosting through my link, get all the details at tomwoods.com slash publicity. Next couple episodes will be fun. It's the last episode that Lou Rockwell and I will be doing for this election season on the presidential debates. So it's like the end of an era in a way. But I'm thinking that maybe Lou and I just need to have regular conversations, maybe a regular monthly discussion of current events or whatever's going on. And by the way, that would force me to stay up on current events, which I totally don't do. I probably need to know what's going on in the world. This would give me good incentive to do so. So I think I may be adding that as a feature. Probably makes sense for me to run this by Lou before I go ahead and tell people about it, but that's certainly my hope, so that's what I think I will do. By the way, I told you yesterday that I got a new microphone just to tide me over until a replacement for my old one arrives, and I think I like this one better. So who knows? It's a embarrassment of riches from a microphone point of view around here. Then on Friday, we're going to be talking to Adam Heyman, who is a professional poker player, so this will be fun topic we have not covered at all, which is libertarianism and gambling and the state and all that. So we're going to talk about that. Then on Monday, my plan is to do my solo episode on my new ebook. This is the one I promised a long time ago, and then I'll just say life got in the way. But I get a lot of people who ask me, how do you do podcasting? Like, what are the nuts and bolts of it? What do I need to buy? What, what um, software do I use? How do I put my podcast up on iTunes? Questions like that, I get a lot. And I've so I've done an, an ebook that explains podcasting. It explains how to self-publish a book, for example, because I've done that. As you know, I did with my book, Real Descent. I self-published, so I learned about that. How do you format a book for Kindle? How do you do an audio book? I did all that. I got all that stuff, step-by-step, step, exactly what I did. I'm sure there are other people who would benefit from what you know, I had to scrounge around to learn. Now I know it, so I put it down in a book. So it's an ebook that covers a lot of ways that you might make your imprint online. And you might be able to make some bucks while you're doing it, but certainly you can make an imprint, uh, your imprint by releasing a book or doing a podcast or blogging or freelancing. I have a chapter on how to do affiliate marketing, all these things in this free ebook that'll be coming on Monday with a companion episode to boot. So Stay tuned for that, but the real thing to stay tuned for is my episode with Lou Rockwell coming up tomorrow, episode 7. Let's see, what would that be? If that's seven, Yeah, it's 763. I thought it was going to be 764, but I had to skip an episode because my microphone broke because I didn't pack it well on the way back from the cruise. All right, I am talking way too much. The episode is over. Thanks for listening. Become a smarter libertarian in just 30 minutes a day. Visit TomWoods.com to subscribe to the show for free, and we'll see you next time.